study here. We're going into uh, Matthew chapter 12, and we're filming this not only for everybody here with us, but we're also filming this for whoever's watching this two weeks from now, two months from now, two years from now on our YouTube channel. And what we're doing is we're going over Matthew chapter 12, verses uh, 43 and, uh, through 45. And uh, this kind of goes back to what we did for the past couple of lessons. We were in, um, I think it was two lessons ago, back uh, maybe a week ago, we were doing Matthew chapter 5, verses 29, the verse that talks about plucking out your eye. And we went through and talked about it's a literal command for the audience it pertains to, which is Israel. And so we talked about it, talked about it literally. You can go and find that on our YouTube channel. Then we did a study on Wednesday. We talked about the seven sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19 and how they went up against an unclean spirit. And so as we were looking for the next study to go into, we said, well, we did a Matthew 5 thing on Sunday. We did a evil spirit thing on Wednesday. So let's look into Matthew, see if we can find some evil spirit verses, see if there's something in there. And sure enough, of course, Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, has where the Lord's explaining to his audience there that uh, well, we'll just read the verses here. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 says, uh, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth not. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So he says this, and a lot of people may hear this at their church. Some some churches have the uh, the healing and the devils and the casting up thing going on, and they may read these verses and they may take them and read them, uh, but they may get the spiritual application or the uh, different types of application. They never take it verbatim literally so we're going to go ahead and do that today and we're going to see you know who is christ talking to why is he saying this what does it mean what what's what's this talking about you know the spirits leaving the house and coming back with seven more uh, what's that all about so we'll go into that but also if you look at luke chapter 11 we'll see the same thing so there's another explanation of this another historical literal account of this in luke 11 verse 24 and actually, in this study, we're going to be jumping around from Luke 11 um, to Matthew 12 in order to get some things in and some other verses as well. But uh, Luke 11, verse 24, there it is. Here we read it again. It says, uh, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. He saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So read the same account uh, given just as you see it in uh, Matthew 12. You see it also in Luke 11. So it's often read by, as we have in our outline here, we have it, it's often read by Bible students and seer believers looking to you know, know what's being said here and then... Uh, you know, they look for the purpose in the verses of, of uh, what's going on in there. Uh, but out of frustration, after they study it, one thing they that's really not taken into account is to rightly divide the word of truth. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, that all of uh, your Bible, all 66 books, has to be what's called rightly divided. So uh, we'll do that, and as, we, as that gets applied, you apply the proper context into the verses. Uh, and you allow the audiences to whom the verses pertain to uh, and the doctrines and the instructions to belong to the audiences to whom Christ is speaking to. So we see this in here. And so we'll, we'll go through this and we'll look at this as well. So just as we said in the Matthew 5 lesson last week, we'll kind of repeat it for this lesson this week, is that not every verse and not every chapter you read in the Bible belongs to me and belongs to you. Not every verse. Every verse can be studied and every verse can be explored and, and uh, dug into and researched, but not every uh, verse has the context of ourselves. We're not going to go ahead and build an ark, but we can study that, you know, there were three levels on the ark and what it was there for, who built the ark, why it was done. You can study all sorts of things in there, uh, but God has a timeline. And you can see that he is speaking in different times or sundry times and diverse manners to different people at different times. 
If we look again at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, you'll see exactly that. And you'll see this is what's said. And in light of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake, in time passed unto the fathers by the prophets. So again, he's saying, as we studied last time, God speaks in sundry or diverse or multiple, uh, sundry times and in diverse manners. He's going to do that because he's giving out the same God who never changes, uh, is dealing with mankind differently in different times, different ways, different audiences, for different purposes. There's, you know, when the Lord dies on the cross, there's an audience before he dies on the cross with different instructions. And then after the cross, uh, things change. So there's uh, different audiences as well. Uh, there's before the flood, and then there's after the flood. And then there's things that happen as Israel's being built up into a nation, uh, there's before the nations there and after the nations there. You've got things on God's timeline, and as mankind reacts to the changes God's doing, uh, you've got a whole timeline set up, and there's different dispensations taking place. There's different audiences, different instructions, and so we have to rightly divide, allow it all to be true, and see the audiences to whom everything belongs to. So we see that there, and that's Second Timothy 2.15 with Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, we're rightly dividing everything. So we'll see that in there. And just like we saw last time, we see to whom uh, the verses belong to. Just as we're reading it today in um, Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 11, Luke 12, chapter 32, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12, verse 32, makes that up, says to whom everything belongs to. We want to see, just as we looked last week at Matthew 5, to whom is Jesus speaking to? We see here in Luke 12, verse 32, he says, fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So again, we're seeing who the audience, uh, who the Lord is speaking to. The audience to whom the Lord is speaking to is the little flock. Now, this is something that is not really spoken of too much in uh, churches today. The little flock of Israel. If we look at Romans chapter 9, verse 4, we'll see roughly who that is. And we won't have time to go through this audience exactly. We'll kind of give the quick rundown. So that we can fit, we can fit the context and the audience and the verse, so we can go into where we are. Romans nine verse four, just like we did last week, said, uh, "Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers? And to whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came?" That's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are your red letters. Jesus came to the Israelites. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, God bless forever. Amen. Verse 6 says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. It definitely took effect. It separated everybody. It says, For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And of course, so we see there, it says, They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. You have some in Israel, in order to kind of speed up the process of where we are. In Israel, you have those Pharisees and Sadducees that no matter what Jesus of Nazareth says, they're not going to believe him. They want to fight him. They want to crucify him. They want to get him out of the way. They want to take him out. They don't believe anything he says. And so they're unbelieving Israel. They're, they're going to be, uh, if you have the wheat and the chaff, they're the chaff. Uh, when you read the parables, when you read what the Lord says, they're the ones that are unbelieving in heart, unbelieving, and they're uncircumcised in heart and ears, as you read in Acts 7. When you look at the other side, in Israel, you have believing Israel. No matter what the Lord says, they will say, yes, whatever you say, you are our Messiah. You are the Son of God. You are God. We will listen to everything you say, and we want to do everything you tell us. That's the 12. That's the, uh, what's called the little flock of Israel, and Jesus is the good shepherd to Israel. And so you see that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's where the separation takes place as the Lord speaks out the doctrines and the parables, and the sermons, and the teachings, it starts separating Israel as he starts uh, teaching. And some say, well, I'm not going to listen to this guy, and others say, well, I want more of what he's saying. And this, the doctrine, separates Israel to believing and unbelieving Israel. So we're setting up the scene for Matthew 12 and Luke 11. So we're seeing this take place here. And so as we go through, we're seeing that this uh, book is written to them. Uh, the little flock of Israel and, and Israel in general at this point in time. This is to whom the Lord is speaking to. You can also see that in uh, Galatians 4.4. 4. This is where it's being said. So the context, we're setting up the context for this. So I will look at that. And then as we go more into reading 
uh, the context of setting up Luke, I'm sorry, Matthew uh, 12, 43 through 45. Now let's go back into Luke 11 again. And we're going to back up, read some verses, uh, Luke eleven fourteen. 14. And this time we're going to work our way into uh, verse 26. Maybe Luke eleven fourteen. 14. Yeah, actually, what would we even back up even further? Luke eleven nine. 9. That way we can work the full way into where we're headed when it comes to the seven other spirits and the house and everything else. We're going to start it in uh, Luke 11, verse 9, work our way all the way in. Uh, so we see here in Luke 11, 9, he says, And I say unto you, this is again the Lord speaking to Israel now, now that we know we're, we're not the ones in there. Uh, in Luke 11, the Lord hasn't even died on the cross yet. There is no body of Christ. There is no Apostle Paul. That's going to become, that's going to come up later. And a lot of churches like to add the body of Christ into this, uh, but we're not there yet. So we see here, And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. <clears throat> Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened uh, unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be uh, opened. If a son shall ask bread, any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give uh, for a fish, uh, give him a serpent? Or if he uh, shall ask an angel, will he offer him a scorpion? If he then, being evil, uh, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So the topic or the, uh, the, the context of what's being talked about here is the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that takes place in Acts chapter 2. You no, know, that's, again, Peter. That's the Apostle Peter, not the Apostle Paul. So we're still dealing with Jews and Hebrews and Israel. In Acts chapter 2, you can study that chapter out if that's a questionable chapter. And it pretty much is. It's a battleground chapter. But nonetheless, you're still dealing with Israel and Jews in Acts chapter 2, not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not even there yet. Um, that's another study for another time. But you'll see in Acts, uh, I'm sorry, not Acts, here in verse 13 of Luke 11, he says, uh, the point of where he's going with all this is, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? So the point is, in the audience that's there listening to Christ through his uh, parables and his teachings and his sermons, he's saying you just have to ask. If you ask, it'll be done. And as the point of the, him asking, of Israel asking, is that you, you ask, it'll be done. I'm not going to throw you a serpent if you ask for the Holy Spirit. And he talks more about it. You read about it in John as, as the comforter. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God is uh, the comforter for them. And he kind of goes on from there. But then we go into verse 14. It says, and, and he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass that when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake. And the people wondered. So now you're seeing you know, the Holy Spirit as something that uh, Israel is going to have to ask for. The believing remnant, the little flock of Israel, they're going to ask for it. Uh, um, Unbelieving Israel, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're just, they want nothing to do with it, unfortunately for them. But we'll see here, uh, he starts casting out devils. So now we're seeing unclean spirits being dealt with, the Holy Spirit being addressed, uh, you know, God the Holy Spirit. So this is the context of where we're going into Luke 11, which is also Matthew chapter 12. So we're seeing this here. Uh, and he came out in the dump spake, and the people wondered. So again, we're setting up. We're still just setting up the context here. It says, but some of them said uh, in verse 15, he casteth out devils through bales above the chief of devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, and said unto them, uh, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your uh, sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. He says, but if I with the finger of God do cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. And we see in verse 21, he starts talking, but uh, when a strong man armed keepeth uh, his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, uh, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusteth and divided his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that 
uh, gathereth not with me scattereth. So again, that goes back to Romans 9, verses uh, 4 through 6 we were just reading. It said, not all Israel, uh, people who say they are uh, of Israel, if, uh, they're not all Israel. You see that in verse 23. He that is not with me is against me. Uh, if you say you're Israel, but you're not doing the things that I say, you're against me. So he's setting up a standard. He's setting up you know these things, and it's being you know, separation is taking place in Israel. It says, "And he that gathereth not with me scattereth." So he's saying, you know, I I am the as you read the book of John. I'm the door. I'm the gate. I'm the bread of life. I'm I'm it. You know, I'm the way, the life, and, and truth, the way, and the life. I'm I'm it. Israel, you're you're with me or you're not. And so you're seeing this take place here. And here we are in verse 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return into my house once I came out. So now he's addressing you know, the, he's, we're plugging this into the idea of uh, Israel needs to ask for the Holy Spirit. And there he goes, the Lord continues to uh, prove his ministry, who he is by casting out unclean spirits. And then he explains, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So, so far we've not dug deep yet. We've just kind of covered the basics of saying, We're, this is not us. We're not in this. Here's the layout of the chapter. Uh, here's the audience to whom it pertains. And so now we're jumping into it, uh, you know, Matthew 12 and Luke 11 to explain uh, Matthew 12 verses uh, 43 through 45. So as we go through here, we're going to start to see this, that indeed, uh, you know, backing up more so, we're seeing that this is where Israel witnesses the miracles. And as we were talking about this here, especially in verse 14, he's casting out a devil, and it was dumb, and it came to pass that when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. So Israel's witnessing these miracles. And this is not the only verse that talks about it, but they're clearly seeing uh, that the Lord can do what he says he can do. He can be their provider. He can be their healer. He can be the one that does everything he says he can do. And just after he says, uh, Israel, you need to ask for the Holy Spirit. And so he sets this up and he lets them know this. And he says, uh, but yet you see that the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're just in light of watching all this happen. They're not asking. They're not asking for any of it. They would still want nothing to do with them. And so uh, we know that the Holy Spirit of God is going to be a part of Israel in their New Testament. If we look at Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, we'll refer to that chapter. Ezekiel 36, verse 26, talking about Israel in their New Testament. And again, this is another study for another time, but we know Israel got the Old Testament, Moses and everything else. So Israel is going to be the same recipients of the New Testament, which means we don't get either one of those either. Another study for another time. But uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. When we see here, again, Ezekiel, this book also written to Hebrews, written to Old Testament Jews, we see here it says, uh, God confirms that they will get a New Testament. And he says in verse 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. You know, they're going to have to ask. That's, uh, you know, uh, or be part of a little flock in which that's what they do in the first place. They listen to them, they join up, and they ask. Uh, and I will take away the stony heart uh, out of your flesh and will give you a uh, heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And then he tells them he shall dwell in the land. And we kind of covered that a little bit two lessons ago. But uh, you're seeing there talking about he'll put he'll put his spirit within him and cause them to keep it, his statutes and judgments. So he's going to have Israel be a part of what he's doing, of course. But the little flock of Israel are the believing uh, remnant Jews and Hebrews that will join up with them. And we're seeing that there are those that, no matter what he does, no matter how many he heals, no matter how many unclean spirits and devils he casts out, they just refuse to join up. That, that there. So as he continues on, uh, we're seeing that asking and believing is a part of having that right heart for believing the doctrine. We kind of covered that a little bit uh, last week. They have to have that right heart for believing what the Lord's talking about. 
uh, setting that up. And so we see this here. So the Hebrew in, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is uh, listening to what the Lord says and has to decide for themselves that what uh, Christ is saying is, is correct and, and right, and that he is truly their Messiah, that is, is there in the flesh, according to the scriptures. He truly is God in, in all of his deity attributes. And so they have to decide this, and then they have to decide to obey the doctrines that he's teaching and believe what he's saying. Uh, you know, they have to choose you know, to have that heart change and be converted by what he's saying and through his teachings and parables and so on. And we saw a little bit about this. I'll just give out the verses because this was covered before. Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, you can read about uh, the Jew from the inside out, not the outside in. Uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10 is not a gospel for today. It's about Israel confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord because he's standing right there in front of them. They need to do that. They need to ask him for the Holy Spirit. They need to believe him when he teaches. They need to confess him as, as God and as their Messiah. And that's based on Matthew 12, verse 32 and 33, which also goes back to Romans, again, 9, 4 through 6. Uh, but this has been taught in previous lessons as well. I just wanted to give those verses out again. But again, setting up Luke 11 and Matthew 12, the little flock of Israel is to have power over the devils and the power of Satan that you see there in prophecy. Uh, power over the rebellion taking place and over the concept of flesh and blood in general. Uh, God's Spirit lets them accomplish God's purposes and prophecy. And uh, yet you're seeing these, this generation of unbelieving Israelites, uh, Hebrews and Jews that we're seeing in here in this chapter, Luke 11 and Matthew 12, same chapter, uh, or at least the same uh, issues are being addressed, which is why we're in it. Uh, they've rejected his teachings and his authority over them. And so they're not going to receive him as Messiah. At least a portion of them aren't. And so he warns them. The Lord Jesus Christ warns them. Here's the result of what's going to happen if you're rejecting me. He goes, I'm the standard. And if you reject the standard, here's what's going to happen. And so he says, you know, especially in the tribulation. So he says, if, you know, I'll, I'll cast out these devils now. Uh, but in the tribulation or later on, it's going to be seven times as bad. There's, there's more coming back. You know, you may, you know, as, as we'll plainly say, it, you may, uh, I'll cast out these devils now. You may clean up the house and make it look pretty, but seven more are coming back. And if you don't accept me now, you know, it's, it's looking bad. So we'll, we'll kind of address that. So let's go to Matthew chapter, uh, we're keeping our place here in Luke 11, go to Matthew chapter uh, 12, verse uh, 43. Again, we're going to be jumping back and forth, Luke 11, Matthew 12, and then other various verses. But we see there again, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. So we see this here. And uh, again, when you uh, parallel that or cross-refer that to uh, Luke 11, verse 14, he was saying before, that uh, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, we saw this take place in, in verse 14 of Luke 11. And when he was casting out a devil, it was dumb. It came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake. So there's where the devil was being casted out. This is where we see this when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, because it's being cast out in this case by the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the example there. It says, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. So again, just to... You see that real quick. Um, look at my uh, notes right here. You've seen that the Lord's going around casting out the devils and unclean spirits. You got that part. And he says that uh, it's gone out of a man. He says, he walketh through dry places. Now you go into the commentaries and you want to see, well, what does that mean? He, you know, the, the unclean spirit walketh through dry places. And it'll talk about, well, he's talking about, that's not a literal place. It's talking about spiritually dry. There's no gospel there. So it needs to be moistened with the gospel of the kingdom or moistened with the, it's not, it's actually not that. Uh, what it's talking about is it's a literal dry place. The unclean spirit walketh through dry places, literally. And we'll prove that through Luke chapter 8. So if we look at Luke chapter 8, uh, the verses there is verse 28. The commentaries like to go there and say, well, Jesus didn't really mean what he said. But we're going to take things from a spiritual angle and say it's, it's spiritually dry and we need things to get spiritually 
uh, went with the gospel, and that's why you need water baptism, and they run down that road. And, of course, we don't want to do that. Uh, if we look at Luke 8, verse 28, and we're going to read the words of the unclean spirit here. Let me see. We've got this. Here. He says, And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him. And uh, he was uh, kept bound with chains and fettered, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And he besought him that he would uh, not command them to go out into the deep. And so uh, reading that, you skip over or you may kind of pass over verse 31. Uh, and he besought them that he would not command them to go out into the deep, the deep water. You're saying, don't go out into the deep. They don't, they don't want to go. They want dry places. So don't send them out to the deep. Keep them, in, keep them where it's dry. And so we see this here. And of course, if they go into the swine, the swine shouldn't be there. We read uh, in the studies a couple, uh, I think it was two studies ago, that this was a person involved in Baal worship. He was cutting himself and, and everything else. And there shouldn't even be swine in Israel, but there's a whole farmland or something going on there. But nonetheless, we're seeing that uh, the, the unclean spirit says, uh, uh, you know, don't send us into the deep. So he says that there, and then it lines up with what we're looking at in verse 43 of Matthew 12. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places. And of course, seeking rest goes back to where we are, Luke 8, verse, I believe it is 28, Luke 8, 28. Uh, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. And he's looking for rest. He knows he's got a life of torment ahead of him. We as the body of Christ, we know we have a life, we have a great future ahead of us. We know that this, this is set in our minds, and even when we have a bad day, we, we, that gives us encouragement to get over the troubles we're going through, knowing that we have a life of glory ahead of us, serving the Lord and being with him and being members of his body forever and ever, no matter what. The devils know that they have a life of torment ahead of them. So no matter what, they're seeking rest while they can find it here, um, apparently in dry places. And uh, as they go through this, they're trying to find it, but they, they can't find you know, peace because they're the ones who are, apparently, they, they know that they have a life ahead of them of misery and torture. Because they're the ones who decided to rebel and serve Lucifer rather than God. So we see that in Matthew 8, and, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew uh, 12, based on Luke 8. He says, don't send us into the deep, they prefer the dry places. They're looking for rest. They know they've got torment ahead of them. So we're seeing this take place here, and this is where we're plugging ourselves into in verse um, uh, Matthew 12, verse 43. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places. It's making a little bit of sense there. He, um, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. And so one, one theory I was you know, trying to find more and more and more answers to this. The commentary said something like this, and I'll leave this up into the air. You can disagree. It totally fine if it doesn't make sense or whatever. Is if you read in Genesis six, there was the flood, and how they took to themselves wives, and they did what they did in Genesis six, and then the flood came. That might have been their fear of water. And now that's I'll leave that up in the air. That may sound you know, makes no sense, or it makes perfect sense. One or the other. Um, I'll leave that. As information you can chew on and, and disagree with or agree with, and that's that's neither here nor there. It's not like it's gospel or salvation information. It's just a piece of information, you know, reaching through the commentaries and finding that. I, was, I thought that might be of interest, but it may not be the ultimate answer. So figure throw that out there. But again, we're seeing he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. So we're seeing verse uh, forty three play out there. It's also interesting to see as you put more and more together, when you see these unclean spirits or rebellious angels, now we know where 1 Corinthians 6 comes in, that we're going to judge them. Uh, we're also seeing that uh, another characteristic or another quality about them is also what you read in Jude, 
chapter 1, verse 6. And we're just putting together a couple of pieces related to all this. Uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 6. Apparently, they don't like going into the deep. They like dry places. Also, you see there it says, And angels which kept not their first state. This is Jude. There's only one chapter, verse 6. But left their own habitation. Uh, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. That's you know, tor torment me not before the time. You see them talking about everlasting change under darkness. Uh, apparently, change under darkness is a bad thing for them as well. And what that means in the big picture is not, you know, just wanted to throw that out there. But change under darkness keeps them locked up. Why? It needs more study on that. But also, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 mentions again the chains of darkness or chains under darkness. You've got, uh, you know, again, to mention these things about unclean spirits they don't like the water they like the dry places that's where they try to find a place to be and uh you know locking them up under chains of darkness uh, again all interesting just want to throw it out there um putting together a big picture on that i'm just going to do that later but i want to present that for you just to put try to put all this together and it's interesting to see so we see that there but uh, again they know torments ahead so that's why they do what they do. You can also see, going back to verse 43, that as the Lord's explaining all this to Israel, to this you know, uh, unbelieving generation, that uh, he's also, it's also going to refer to um, Israel itself. What I mean by that is when we see when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, and when it, go, when it goes out of you know, Israel itself, it's going to refer to the entire uh, nation of Israel. Uh, that man, quote unquote, will also refer to all of Israel. And we'll plug that in as we read through it. He walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Uh, verse 44 Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. So, as we see that there, we're going to read into uh, more about that. But again, like I said, we're jumping back and forth in order to plug more uh, details into what the Lord's talking about. So we're going to go back to Luke 11 again, and we're going to look into verse 21. We get there, Luke 11, verse 21. And this is where we were a little bit earlier. And he was, he was saying, um, how, um, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils, he was talking like that, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he said in verse 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, uh, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusteth and divideth his spoils. So we're seeing this come into play as to what the Lord's talking about when it comes to himself and when it comes to Lucifer. Uh, Luke 11, uh, 21, as we read it there, uh, the strong man is, is Lucifer there. He goes, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, now, he talks about it being, you know, his palace. Uh, he says here, and we'll see this in Matthew 12, 44 in a minute as we keep flipping back and forth. He says, when a strong man arm keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. So he's, he's you know, he usurped authority from Adam. You know, in Matthew 4, he says, you know, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, he is grabbing that authority, even though it doesn't belong to him, but he's, he's claiming it. It doesn't belong to him, yet he says it's his. So the devil here, Lucifer here, is the strong man. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are at peace. You know, his goods are what are essentially, uh, in the prophetic program, he's holding down Israel. But he's trying to until the Lord shows up, and that's what we see in verse 22. But when a stronger than he, the Lord Jesus Christ, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, shall uh, come upon him and overcome him, you'll see that in Revelation. You'll see that uh, during the you know tribulation, Revelation eleven. I'm sorry, nineteen eleven, and uh, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils. That's going to take place in Revelation. That's going to take place in the ages to come. And that's where he says, "He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not me scattereth." So we're getting more context. We're getting more explanation as to where we are. You know, we're flipping back to Matthew chapter twelve, verse forty-four. 
So he's saying, you know, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Matthew 12, verse 44 goes on to say, Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. So again, now we're seeing what's happening after the Lord casts out these unclean spirits and these devils, and they're looking for a little dry ground away from the deep, away from water, uh, seeking rest. They know torment is coming at some point in the ages to come. They know they will be cast out and uh, everything else, as well as the devil in the ages to come. They know the plan. They know, as we talked about in that Acts chapter 19 lesson, they know what God's plans and purposes are. And yet they're seeking, you know, dry places to you know, get away for a while, so to speak. It says in verse 44, when he said, I will, uh, or sorry, then he said, I will return into my house from whence I came out. But there's two words there that we just talked about from verse, I believe it was verse, uh, or in uh, Luke 11. But he had said, I will return into my house. Again, there's the evil spirits, there's uh, the devil saying, that's that's mine, I took it. I, I uh, laid claim to Israel. That's my house, is what Israel is, or that's what the devil is saying. And that's why when one stronger than the strong man comes along, he can set things right again, as we saw in Luke 11, uh, 21 and 22. But it says there, then he saith, you know, the unclean spirit, I will return to my house. That's my house. You know, it's not your God, it's my house. Uh, and if you apply this into the land of Israel, you're applying this into, you know, the, the individual Hebrew or uh, the Jew himself, they're, they're laying claim to them as if they're cattle or property, or you see how, how wicked the mind of the unclean spirits and the devil is. They're saying we're, we're nothing but his property. So we see that there. And he says, uh, I will return unto... Uh, my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, uh, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. And there's a couple of uh, verses we can look at. When we talk about, he says, I will return into my house. If you look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 31. Exodus chapter 16, verse 31. Some things I want to point out, which is why I keep saying that uh, a good example to use as uh, what's being talked about here is not just the individual Jew or the individual man, that you're seeing in uh, Matthew 12 or Luke 11. But you can also apply this to the entire house of Israel. If we look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 31, and we're looking at this for context, we're looking at this for application. And they talk about when manna comes down for Old Testament Israel. But the way the group is defined, in Exodus 16, verse 31, it says, And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. So that group is called the house of Israel. And it's Moses and Aaron and everybody walking through the wilderness. But they're defined as, they're called, they're labeled the house of Israel. <clears throat> That's Exodus uh, 16, uh, 31. If we look at Exodus 40, verse 38. Exodus 40, verse uh, 38. I believe that's, uh, yeah, that's the last verse of Exodus. It says there, um, Exodus 40, verse 38 says, For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, and the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journey. So again, they're, they're titled or labeled, as you want to call it, the house of Israel. And so we read this here, and one more is going to be uh, Leviticus 10, verse 6. And Leviticus 10, verse 6. Yeah, there we go. That's what I want. Again, just seeing examples of the 12 tribes, Moses and Aaron and, and everybody that uh, we read about and study about historically and literally, uh, we're seeing them come up as uh, what their title. And it says, And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and unto Ithamar, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren... The whole house of Israel bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. Again, the whole house of Israel. You're seeing this house being explained, the whole house of Israel. So this comes up here, and this is where this is you know, coming into play, that Israel is being titled or, or referred to as the house of Israel. So now when we plug this back in, 
And we see this in um, Matthew 12, verse uh, 44, I believe it is. You're seeing that here where he says, Then he saith, I will return into my house, house of Israel, what from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. And so now we're finding it empty, swept, and garnished. And so we're seeing the devils returning to the same place from whence he uh, had come out, where he was cast out, these devils. And he's going to retake ownership of the house of Israel again. And so he does this. And he, he's going to come in and find it empty, swept, and garnished. I think if we look at uh, Luke, uh, this is in, uh, we'll go back to Luke 11 again, verse 25, and we're just bouncing back and forth here, but we're seeing it for a point, seeing it for a reason. Uh, Luke 11, 25, verses uh, Matthew 12. Now the verses are starting to make a little more sense as opposed to it just being uh, what it was. But we see in Luke eleven twenty five 25, it says, And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Now Matthew 12, uh, verse 44 says, He findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Excuse me. So he's saying the, the evil spirits and the devil and stuff saying he's going to return back into Israel. And he's going to come back and find the house, whether it be the individual Jew or the entire house of Israel itself. He comes back to where he once was, and he finds the place empty, swept up or swept, and garnished, or it's decorated. Uh, you know, garnished being decorated or otherwise. Now it's decorated most likely with uh, you know some sort of uh, religious you know decoration. In this case, it would either be the mark of the beast, the antichrist and his system, which he's got set up, uh, which is going to be all the more easier for these devils to re-inhabit where they once were, especially in the tribulation. Or if you're reading it during this time, uh, it's going to be with whatever system, Baal worship, or whatever's going on during Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But he's saying here that uh, he's going to go and he's going to find that this house is empty, swept, and garnished. So he finds he finds that there was a, there was a cleanup done from when he was once inhabited from when he once inhabited the individual or or the nation but if unbelieving israel the pharisees and the sadducees in other ways they don't believe on the lord jesus christ have that heart change um, they really didn't do what needed to be done in the first place and so we see this is why uh, the verses pop up like they do if you look at revelation chapter 3 verse 20 it's in uh, revelation 3 20 He said, ask, seek, and knock, you know, for that Holy Spirit. Some, some of course, ask, and they get uh, blessed with it, we'll call it, in um, Acts chapter 2 and, and beyond that. But this is why he's showing up as he is, and he's saying, get this, well, Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says, now, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will uh, sup with him and he with me. This is like a literal command. There's a literal door, a literal thing where the house is clean and swept and garnished, but you've got to let, in this case of Israel, Israel has to let in the Lord Jesus Christ to their house. Uh, they have to accept his doctrines, believe what he's saying, listen to the parables, research what's being said, and accept what he's teaching not just run off and uh, obey uh, the Antichrist or the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes or uh, anything else that's being taught or any or Baal worship or anything that's going on at the time. Uh, they would have to listen and hear what he says and let him in and be a part of what's, you know, going That's something we read about there, and this is why things are uh, being uh, written as they're written. But we see this in verse uh, 44, that this is why it's being said the way it is. Uh, if we look also, this is mentioned previously, even by Old Testament prophets, that they knew Israel was going to be nothing more than just an empty, barren, worthless, useless type of house. If you look at the book of Hosea, chapter 10, even uh, Hosea knew this. In the book of Hosea, chapter 10, uh, he mentions this as well. In verse 1.
what he goes through to describe this. Let me see if we got Isaiah. Yeah, there we are. Hosea chapter 10, verse 1 says, Israel is an empty vine. Uh, he bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased his altars. That's not good. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. Uh, he shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. For now uh, they shall say, we have no king because we feared not the Lord. What then uh, should a king do to us? They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Uh, thus judgment uh, springeth up as hemlock and the furrows in the, of the field. And so this is how he describes it in verse uh, 1, saying Israel is, is empty. It's an empty vine. And so this is where you see this when it comes to uh, Matthew. And he's saying the same thing, that when they return, it's just, a, it's just an empty, barren uh, house. It's swept up. And it's garnished, but it's just an empty, barren, swept up, garnished house. You know, nothing was done to protect it. Nothing was done to fix it. It's just an empty, swept up uh, house from the first time they were there. So we see this there. And if you look at Matthew chapter 23 in verse uh, 37. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. You're going to see that he's going to mention this again. He talks about the house of Israel, talks about how it's empty, it's uh, desolate, it's barren. And we see in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, he says, Oh, Jerusalem. Now he's referring to them, you know, specifically saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered my children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not? He says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, you know, just as you read it in uh, Matthew 12, just as you see it in Luke 11. You know, this is the explanation of where we're going with this. Your house is left unto you desolate, you know, empty, barren, uh, and, and in their case, garnished. He says, For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, they have to say it, they have to ask, they have to let them in, they have to, in Revelations 3 case, they have to open the door and let them in, literally. Until ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. I mean, so he's referring, of course, to unbelieving Israel, saying, You have to literally say it yourself. You have to literally believe on what I'm saying and what I'm doing, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the standard, and everything else. And you have to have that heart conversion, as we talked about two studies ago. Uh, Israel, you have to believe this. Uh, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So he says that to him. And so as we kind of plug this into where we're seeing, this is why we're reading what we're reading in Matthew chapter 12, verse 44. For then he saith, that unclean spirit saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he has come, he findeth it, empty, swept, and garnished. And so we're reading this, you know, take place here. Verse 45 says, Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto, or also unto, this wicked generation. So we're seeing this, you know, plug in verse 45. So he goes through and he explains this. And uh, one thing you see in the first, I guess, say sentence there, says, Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven <clears throat> other spirits more wicked than himself. I would say um, the key flying that point out there is in uh, verse 45, that first sentence there where it says, seven other spirits more wicked, more wicked than himself. So that may indicate a hierarchy. Uh, it's only two words, but he t takes the original uh, evil spirit that was cast out, walks through those dry places, uh, and then comes back later. Perhaps the only time the um, Prophecy, when the prophecy program kicks in again, the reason why they'd all start pouring back in would be when the Antichrist sets up his kingdom. And when they come back, they're going to find, in this case, they'll bring back seven spirits more wicked. Now, of course, as a footnote I have here uh, on our outline, it's not uh, unusual that something like a hierarchy would be in place. We know that uh, we have, uh, refer to my notes real quick, um, we have, Oh, there we go. We've got uh, 
you know, three heavens. That's in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. So we've got, I say hierarchy, but you've got three heavens. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians 12, 2. You have degrees of damnation. And uh, greater damnation is talked about by the Lord in Matthew chapter 23, verse 14. So now we're reading about different degrees of uh, evil spirits. And you're seeing this here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 45. He taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So if you got one that's more wicked, you probably got one that's less wicked. Not that they're nice or anything, but you're seeing there's a, there's a degree or possible hierarchy there. Uh, so again, more information, more knowledge about who these evil spirits are. And you see, you know, how they look for dry places as opposed to the deep. How you can time up in chains of darkness. Just interesting to see that and how there's possible hierarchy amongst them there. You can see some of them there in uh, Revelation about Apollyon and, and others, but that's there for you know, more knowledge and study as well. But he goes on and says that uh, other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So read that there, and the Antichrist you know, will set himself up as God. You read that in uh, Thessalonians, you read that in uh, Matthew, that he'll set himself up and all, bring all the evil spirits back with him. And so they enter in, and then they dwell there. If you look at Mark uh, 16, Mark 16, verse 9. For seven spirits to be brought into an individual, it's not, it's not an unusual thing. For example, you see here, Mark 16, verse 9 says, Now when Jesus was risen early from the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So it's not like that's an unusual thing. Seven devils would uh, come back with the first one. It's, it's happening here with, with Mary Magdalene there in uh, Mark 16. So that's not a, an unusual thing. If you look at, uh, even in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. And that's Revelation uh, 16, verse 13. What you're seeing here is a little bit of what he's talking about in Matthew chapter 12 and in Luke chapter 11, what we're kind of going over. That's Revelation 16, verse uh, 13. And uh, you're seeing the unclean spirits. They're back. Just as he had said. It says, and I saw three unclean spirits, and they're like frogs, they're, they're not frogs, uh, but they're like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. These unclean spirits are everywhere. It says, for they are the spirits of devils, uh, working, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. So they're, they're four-star generals, pretty pretty much in the uh, in the ages to come. And as the uh, Antichrist takes over the earth, he's pretty much setting them up to uh, fight, uh, fight and wage war against God, which they all lose, but they're pretty much there to set up a battle against God during the earth, during that time. So we see that take place there, but the evil spirits are there. And that's why he's saying that uh, in, the Lord is saying in Matthew 12 and Luke 11, I may cast out these devils now of your house, you know, O house of Israel, but when they come back, mm -hmm. the state of your nation is going to be seven times worse than what it is now, because if they're, if they're going to use you to set up battle against me in the ages to come, it's not going to be, a, it's not, that's not a good, you know, scenario for you guys to be set up, you know, unbelieving Israel. So you see that uh, come out to play here. And uh, yeah, so that's this Ellen in Revelation 18, too. That's the other one I wanted to look at. Uh, Revelation 18, verse 2. And of course, when Babylon falls, as the timeline plays out, um, God's timeline already knows what's going to happen. He says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great uh, is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and uh, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of uh, every unclean and hateful bird. Uh, you know, so you see there's the habitation of devils uh, over there, and you know, they may be seeking the dry places there. That's more to research about that. But again, this is basically our explanation, our, our research into 
Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through 45, because a lot of times when you just initially read that, you may say, well, what, what does that mean? Now, I'm going to return it to my house and, and bring seven others, and they're walking through dry places. Uh, you know, what, 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 what does that mean? Why am I reading about dry places? You know, are they are they walking around? You know, is this a is this as the commentary say? Is this a, a spiritually dry place with no spiritual gospel? And is this talking spiritually, metaphorically, literally, generally? And of course, literally, everything in your Bible you can take literally, except for the Bible says, "Hey, it's an allegory. I'm letting you know something allegorically." That literally is what is being talked about here. That the nation of Israel, there's the Lord Jesus Christ saying, "Israel, you have to ask me." For the Holy Spirit, and when you do, it's got to be with the right heart, and which means you got to be listening to what I'm saying as I teach the doctrines and inform you of what's coming up. Um, and so, as they, he's warning him, he's giving him that heads up, he's giving him that warning. The unclean spirit, as it's cast out, is walking around dry places in Jerusalem, Middle East, plenty of dry places. There, he's saying, uh, seeking rest and finding none. And he says, uh, I will return to my house uh, from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth empty, swept, and garnished. And then he's essentially saying, you know, I, I'll cast them out now, but they're coming back. Uh, the only way to really protect yourself from seven other spirits greater than the one I just cast out is for you to you know, let me in from Revelation 3, verse 20. Let me into your house. And, you know, believe what I'm saying. Believe everything that's being said. Be a part of the game plan that's going on. You know, Israel. And yet he says in you know, Matthew 23, you just, you won't have me. I'm trying to gather you up as like a hen uh, would gather his chicks under his wings and you, you're you not having me. You need to have me in order for things to work, uh, setting up a plan and you're just not being a part of it. So uh, we're seeing this play out here, but he's saying, but those devils are coming back. And when they come back, as you read in Revelation 16 and Revelation 18, uh, they're coming back with vengeance. Uh, it's going to be seven times bad when they do come back. And uh, you'll see that the, they'll come back and they'll see that your house, your nation, uh, you in general are, you're all swept up. You're all cleaned up from the last time you were here. You're all decorated. You know, you may even have the mark of the beast on you. You can see that in Matthew 25. But, uh, you know, that doesn't mean you're not going to be inhabited seven times worse than the first time, you know, when they were there the first time. So, and this is, an, and then to wrap up the verse in verse 45, it says, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be un also unto this wicked generation, and referring to Israel. So I read that there. So then you would read that, and you would maybe hear this in, in the church up the street from you. And it says, well, how do I answer that if I'm a part of the church, the body of Christ, preaching Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? Where do I go for this? How do I answer that? Of course, we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. We'll start there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in verse 1. Israel had to watch out for these times and these seasons. They need to know they had to be always watching for the Antichrist. Where is he? Who is he? When's he coming? Matthew 24 gives the timeline. Here's what you need to be watching out for for the end of the world and when the Antichrist shows up, when these devils are going to come, when these earthquakes and, and uh, just terrible events are going to happen. For us, the church, the body of Christ today, uh, in the dispensation of grace, God's wonderful uh, grace, we see in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. That's uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Uh, for when they shall say peace and safety, that's in the ages to come, um, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, as that they should not uh, over or should overtake you as a thief. It's not going to play out like that. But ye are all children of the light and of children of the day. Ye are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, and as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And he kind of goes on and explains it from there. So we see this uh, happen through this, but uh, it's going to happen through there. And we also know through Galatians four, uh, verses nine through ten, as they were paying attention to days. And times and months and years, the Lord said, I'm afraid of you, Galatians. Uh, this is not what I uh, taught you to do. This is not how I set things up for you. So he said this to them as well. But uh, in general, we see that uh, overall, when it comes to the evil spirits 
and Lucifer and the devil, uh, they know his plans, they know his timeline, his purposes, his scriptures, and they work at counterfeiting and corrupting it all. Uh, just as we had studied in Acts chapter 19 a couple of days ago, uh, we also know through uh, James chapter 2 verse 19 that the devils believe everything God has said and they trouble at it. They're, they're worried about what's going to happen with their future, as we had mentioned earlier from uh, Luke 8 and uh, even Matthew 8, read that. Uh, they know who's been given power and who has it and why. Uh, when God changed programs from prophecy to mystery, uh, from Israel to the body of Christ, and from the earth to the heavens, the land and the people of the land, this, in this case the house of Israel, are no longer the issue. The devil knew he had to counterfeit what God was doing. And so our battle today becomes, as we had said in our last study, Ephesians chapter 6. If you look there, Ephesians chapter 6 in uh, verse 10, just as we read last time. We'll read this again. Now, we know that this is our fight today, and this is where we'll start to wrap up here. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, we read that we're not trying to cast out devils. We're not trying to uh, do these things. The Lord did that in his prophetic program to Israel. We see that in Luke 11 and Matthew 12. That's what we just explained today. We see something different here. He was dealing with flesh and blood by casting out devils, as that was a part of the satanic counterfeit program where Israel was supposed to be a kingdom of priests, the devil said, well, I'm going to make sure that we inhabit flesh and blood through these devils so that there can't be king, there can't be priests in this kingdom. There are going to be people who are worshiping Baal and cutting themselves, and we're going to inhabit them and lock them up and keep them for ourselves. That's, that's my house, as we read through the scriptures. Uh, we see in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, uh, the response to Today, the, the battle today, the fight today, is finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The Lord did in Matthew 12, and the Lord did in Luke 11. We don't. We're not instructed to. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, it's not that we don't fight, we have certain things we fight against but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, the gospel of peace is the gospel of Christ today. Again, if you're still watching this on YouTube and everything else, you've been with us the whole time, there's multiple Gospels in the Bible. You can read Acts 2.38, you can read John 3.16, you can, and even John 3.16 is not a Gospel, but you can see several things that people turn into the Gospel. Romans 10.9 and 10, Revelation 14, uh, pretty much any verse could be twisted into what people would call good news as the Gospel. But where you're going to find where the Apostle Paul said you can be saved by this is if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, where we see about where, where is our gospel for today. When people say, I want to believe the gospel and be saved and go to heaven, you know, where is it? What is it? Where do I find it? Is it Acts 2? Is it John 3? Is it Romans 10? It's actually 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here's what we find, where it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. He says, by which also ye are saved. So you can be saved by believing this gospel. He says, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that, here's the information that we need, that's good news. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So we see that Christ is the fully sufficient payment for all of our sins, the, the penalty for our sins, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We just believe that, uh, cross-referring that to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, and understanding that that's the gospel by which uh, we're saved, the good news by which we're saved. It's not about the gospel of the kingdom as we're reading about in uh, Matthew chapter 12 or Luke chapter 11, which that was their gospel. It's not that it's wrong or bad or or uh, terrible, but it's not our gospel. It's their gospel for that time in Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 11. So we see our gospel in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
We see that the programs have changed indeed today. We see that the, the dispensations have changed. The Bible has to be studied dispensationally. The Bible has to be <clears throat> rightly divided. The audiences have to be put in places, and so the instructions have to match what the audiences are, as God never changes. So God never changes. We know that. Uh, but we have to study the Bible rightly divided and dispensationally. And so we see that there. We see what our fight is. If we look at Romans chapter 16, verse 25, and we'll wrap up here. When you preach Christ today, though we did a study in Matthew 12, I'm not going to go out and preach Christ today according to Matthew, Matthew 12 or Luke 11. My end game, or my, my goal, is not to preach Christ according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to make sure people believe on the Lord according to what he's doing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Though I do want to study it, I do want to know it, I do want to learn it, I do want to understand it, and rejoice in what he did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's nothing wrong with it. But when I want to preach Christ, I want to preach Christ according to how God tells me in his Bible he wants me to preach him. If you look at Romans 16, verse 25, the Apostle Paul tells me how to do that. He says, now to him that is of power to establish you. If you want to be stabilized today, right now, there's some things we need to do, and we've got to do it God's way. He says, establish you according to my gospel, which we just read, 1 Corinthians 15. That's my gospel, Paul's gospel, the gospel of peace. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. God has made known information since his death, burial, and resurrection, and he's made it known to the Apostle Paul. There is no Apostle Paul in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That happens after that. Uh, and by the scriptures of the prophets. We see there the preaching of Jesus Christ is according to the revealing of the information, or what's literally called here the revelation of the mystery, uh, which was kept secret. It was kept secret in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Nobody knew it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, but now it's made manifest. And so now we can know it. Now we can understand that body of data that was given to Saul of Tarsus, who is uh, the Apostle Paul. There was 13 epistles. We can grow in grace, grow in our understanding and our wisdom and knowledge, and preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. That's the body of Christ today. God's agency on the scene today. So there's, of course, a lot more to go through and a lot more to do. But with that, we're going to stop here and see if there's any kind of thoughts or questions based on going through uh, our study on Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through 45 and explaining it. See if there's any thoughts. And if you'd like to join us, if you're watching this on YouTube and you think this was an interesting lesson, uh, put something in the comments and we'll go ahead and uh, we'll see about getting in touch with you. You could join us here. We, we do studies here on computer. Uh, people join us in all sorts of different places. If uh, you'd like to hop in with us, just send us a message in the comment section, and you can uh, join us anytime, anyplace. Uh, but we'll open up to any thoughts, questions, or comments on Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through uh, 45. Uh, stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. When you were talking about the devils and so forth, the dry places, is the lake of fire a dry place or a wet place? Oh, I'd say I'd say dry. I'd say we too. So why is it called a lake as opposed to? That might be the uh, shape. Things today that are called like a lake, but they're like you said, the shape of it. Or a yeah, like why would it be called the ocean? If maybe it's not. I, I would say wet. I don't know. I'm just off the top of my naive head because it says lake, but I don't know. Yeah. You think like lava type of thing or? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I kind of, I don't know. Yeah, Maybe that's a, probably right. wrong, but I think it's kind of like uh, uh, molten lava and your body's in it and it doesn't disappear like the burning bush, but it's in constant agony. That's the way I see it. I don't know. Lake of fire. I don't know kind of went with uh, like Revelation 2015 and there's all you kind of read about is fire but the fire could come from something else so. yeah yeah I, I'm I'm not gonna yeah yeah, yeah you know yeah. get dogmatic about it I'm just thinking off the top of my head unless I read something different and I might <laughs> yeah. yeah could be hot sauce we don't know. <laughs> yeah yeah well I don't know if you uh watched like Deep Space Nine or something. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Remember the guy that was liquid? Yeah. Yeah. Odo. And he was Odo. Okay. So he slept in a pail and, and, and he tried to, to recreate the human form, but it's, he said it was the most complex. So that's why his features were kind of dull. But anyway, when he went to his planet, I guess, I mean, he just jumped into the lake and it was basically just the population all in one big soup, you know, you know, it was the way they communicated or lived their life or whatever in, in one main soup. And, and I don't know, maybe that's kind of what happens with the people being tormented. They're all in one big hot soup and in agony, or maybe they got space between them. I don't know. I, I really can't tell. It's an interesting, it's an interesting yeah. thought. It, yeah, it's just thoughts, just thoughts to, you know, make you expand your brain a little bit about it. That just gets stuck anyway. Did that answer your question, Ernie? No, not at all. <laughs> so we have no def no definite votes on that one. Okay. Um, He's a tough nut. If you're talking about soup, I'll have a cup of chicken and noodle if you got uh, some. Uh, well, and you know the re you know the reason chicken soup is a cure, and it's not always a cure, but it, it depends. It's not what's in the soup. It's the love that poured into it as it's being made, whether it's canned or put into it. Oh, yeah, I do have another. It's not, it's not the chicken or the noodles. <laughs> okay, I do have another question. It, it, it struck me right away. You went to Matthew. Now Matthew, Matthew talked about, you know, the the devil. Luke talked virtually about the same thing. Now, I know Luke didn't hear this from Matthew, did he? I mean, he, he was, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Yeah. So he, he didn't get this from Matthew. This is not something he heard from Matthew and he's repeating it. This is something he was inspired from by God yeah. at, at, at another certain time and yeah. at that period. Yeah. Okay. Because it's yeah, I mean, it's it's the same. Well, they're both. They're both. In a sense, they're quoting what Jesus said. Yeah. It's a little bit different in the, the same account yeah. or the, an account of the same situation or circumstance. That struck yeah. immediately that they're both talking. I'll bring this stuff on. Actually, exactly the same yeah. same thing. With like you said, a few exceptions. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, one says the house is empty, the other exactly. says it's yeah. 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 Well, you know what hit me, and and again Hearing these things 30 times, it's the 31st time that rings a bell. I always, I, I never really thought about it, but when I heard about um, exorcisms or when Jesus casting out devils and stuff, I thought he had this big zap gun, you know, and they were gone. They were totally obliter obliterated. And here we are, actually what you're saying is they're they're cast out, but they're not gone. Yeah, yeah, you right. Know? And that that's very different. I never thought about that until you explained it the way you did, and they're just never gone. And that's kind of a scary thing, you know? Yeah. Well, at least for them. in prophecy, yeah. 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 I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find the verse where. Uh, I mean, and they're called they're called devils, not demons. Yeah, they never. Yeah. Just to make that point clear. I'm trying to find the verse. I think it's Luke 8. The, the swine, um, you know, legion, and then he says, uh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong. But yeah, I didn't the one where he's the swine. Yeah, the swine and everything, but there's uh, another account of it. Uh, but I don't understand if they didn't want to be cast into the deep and they want to be cast into the swine, but the swine went into the deep. Yeah, so I think he got, it's kind of like, uh, I'll get you anyway, and I'll get rid of the swine, which aren't supposed to be here. Oh, but because, yeah, maybe the, uh, oh, the abyss. Yeah, the, the uh, 
the uh, okay. didn't know that the pigs could have run into the or would have run into the water. They could have just run all, all over the countryside and then they could run amok. Yeah. I'm trying to see where does this uh, come up again? Is this uh, yeah. historical, historical account comes up again? And I think in Matthew, um, Matthew, Matthew 8. I think it's Matthew. Yeah, Matthew 8, because I remember that verse. Uh, let's see. Did I, I thought it was. Luke 8. Looking for something other than Luke 8? Yeah, I'm looking for a parallel. Oh, exactly. It was. Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, oh, yeah, the slides. 832. Matthew 832. Yeah. That's, that's about there's something that they say where they say, uh, uh, for us to, where's the one where they, where they specifically refer, um, devils besought him, if thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And, uh, but they, there's, there's another account. There's, there's Matthew eight here. There's, um, Luke eight there. I don't know if it's, maybe it's, maybe it's Mark. I think it is Mark. Mark, maybe it's Mark nine. Let me see. Is it Mark nine? Um, I mean, both are very closely, closely, uh, I mean, what, what's the point that you're trying to bring out? It's that they say, they specifically say that, uh, don't kick me out of the country. They want the land. They want the, uh, in prophecy, it's all about the land. Right. Maybe it's Mark 9 or, but, but the devil say, you know, uh, in order to be thrown into the uh, swine, they they say, "Oh, you can." You know, like I said earlier, they they don't mind using uh, mankind as their personal property. But when the Lord shows up and He's going to throw them into the swine, they say, "Hey, you can throw me into the swine. You can throw me into the. You can do whatever you want. Just don't kick me out of the country. We got we got some uh, things to do with, with this country." Yeah, I'm trying to remember the verse. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, let's, it may after, we, after we get through this, I have a question and a point. Let's see. Legion. Now, nah, there's the part where there's deep. Oh, well. well, I'll probably find it. Uh, well, actually, here's here's that previous study. Um, here you go, Mark 5.10. Oh, Mark 5.10? All right, let's see. Try that one. See where it is here? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's it. Mark 5.10. All right, let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. He says, what is thy name? For he answered, uh, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. So they're beseeching him uh, much, as in, you know, more than once. This legion of devils is saying, just don't kick us out of the country. Don't kick us out of the country. Don't kick us out. So they, they think that they're going to trick as, as devils and the devil thinks that they can somehow outsmart Jesus or whatever, and they say, oh, no, you can go into the swine. I'll just throw the swine off the cliff into the water, into the deep, which they hate. And he, he once again outsmarts them anyway. And uh, on top of that, the revelation of the mystery is going to take place, even if, you know, that played out. So he's always 10,000 steps ahead of everybody. But yeah, yeah, Gene, if you had a... Yeah. Uh, so I maybe I missed it early on, but uh, you, you you kept bringing up that uh, this man who was indwelt with a devil, uh, the devil got kicked out and somehow, and the inside, his inside got swept clean and it, it put in order, whatever. But uh, wh what was your point after that? Is that was there a so you're saying that it was swept up and garnished. And if it was, say, um, a scribe or a Pharisee or someone of the unbelieving Israel side, and they never accept uh, the Lord, it's like kind of living in a high crime area and you get robbed all the time and you just don't put in that burglary system. You just don't do what it takes to make things right. right. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So, yeah, my, my point would be you have to replace mm -hmm. the bad the the devil that was taken out and yeah sure clean up the place but you have to 
refill that place with something good. And for us, that's the new man. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're made new creatures. We're placed in the body of Christ. But, but the new man is placed in us, new man being Jesus. But um, I just got a few uh, examples here, like Acts 13.9. Uh, then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. So he, Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Um, if you look at Acts 9, 17, um, let's see. And I'll just, just do the end of it. And thou, that thou mightest receive thy sight. Oh, when Ananias went to, went to, uh, give Paul his sight, he said, uh, I was sent to the uh, that thou might receive as they say and be filled with the Holy Ghost again. Uh, at, let's see, don't want that one. Acts thirteen fifty two and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Um, let's see. Romans fifteen fourteen. Right? Oops. 1514. Uh, and I myself am also persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are also are filled of goodness, are full of goodness and filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. You know, it's, it's so, and so on. Uh, there, there's several others. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, we can't, we, we, we can't just. Rick and our old man dead, or Rick and ourselves dead to our old man, Rick and the old man circumcised from us by the circumcision not made with hands, and then the whole bag of him is just nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. We, we can't just say, all right, done, and, and then walk, you know, turn around, walk away. We, we, we need to replace that badness with. Christ, I would say, just in simple terms, with Christ. Um, that's just my long two cents. <laughs> Three and a half. We still have our Roman seven struggle going on. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I would, I would say that makes sense. So nothing, nothing wrong with that. But, uh, but yeah, we just wanted to go through that today and kind of bring that up because, uh, not sure how many people uh, watching this, say, two months from now, two years from now, are going to those uh, churches that are teaching about de devils, and they'll even use the word demons. But in the King James Bible, like it was said earlier by Gene, you're not going to find the word demon anywhere in the King James Bible. It's not there. It's not supposed to be there. But devils, evil spirits, unclean spirits, you may hear that. You may, you may wonder if you're going to be possessed by a devil. We kind of went through that if you look at... Uh, the previous study on our YouTube channel, I believe it's called the uh, Skirmish of the Seven Sons of, of uh, uh, Skiva. Skiva, that's it. I was going to say Skiva, but that's a computer program. But uh, yeah. S S C H E V A Skiva. Yep, yeah. Seven Sons of Skiva in Acts chapter nineteen, and so we go over the fact that uh, you know once you're saved and sealed, uh, the Holy Spirit indwells you, and uh, you know you're kind of you're, you're saved. You're you're locked in. You're not uh, going to be inhabited by devils. That's not even God's program today. God's, uh, you know, got us as his agency. The devil has his uh, doctrines of devils being spread out, which is why there's so many divisions and religions and denominations out there preaching false Christs, false doctrines, false information. They're doing their work, but they're not inhabiting anybody today. So. I, no, I mean, once we've got Christ in us, there's no more room. Yeah. yeah. So. But with that, we'll, uh, we'll stop here for today. I'm going to get ready to do the usual 2 o'clock pickup. But, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be back here on Wednesday. And we'll, we'll keep at it with another uh, lesson. And, uh, yeah, I didn't know if there's anything else anyone else wanted to add before we go real quick. or Just want to say hi to Aunt Andrea and uh, Ernie. To you both and this as well. Yes, he's... Uh... Busy preparing a meal. So, uh, 
I'm just trying to trying to learn. <laughs> it's not made, chicken soup, is it? No, I just made some soup too. But we had turkey soup I, I, yesterday, and it was great. So, so yeah, with that, we'll stop here. We'll pick up on Wednesday, and then uh, we'll have another study. Uh, keep going. So, all right. Thank, thank you, John. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for everyone that joined us. Thank you for joining. Yeah, we yeah, we'll appreciate see. it. See you Wednesday. Yep, see you later.